There is going to be a night of worship on uh, February 10th at 6.30, um, and that is going to be here. And so make sure that you're aware of that, February 10th at 6.30. And that's going to really launch into a new series that Pastor uh, Keith has that he's planning on uh, on doing, um, which is all about the love of God and, and just being able to be in that. So he told me to encourage you to bring your friends to this. So make sure you bring your friends and encourage them to come because it's going to be an amazing time, and it's great that he's going to be launching into this series, and uh, I'm looking forward to what's been going on because there's been some amazing things happening at CWC. There really is, and not just the, like the tangible things of what we see, but the spiritual things of what we are encountering as a church, and that's what is so amazing, and I, it's it just, again, it's a privilege to be able to be a part, and it's funny because some people will come up to me, and they'll be like, well, like, you're not here every week. Like, how do you know what's going on? And, like, I do tune in. Like, you know, I do tune in, on, and, and I talk to Pastor Keith on a weekly basis. Um, but with Refuge Youth Network, I'm bouncing around. I'm at, I'm at, like, a different church each Sunday of the month. I have assigned churches that I'm supposed to be at each month so that I can network with all the churches and, and fill in and things like that. And so uh, that is why we're not here every week, um, but we still are in full support of what God is doing. And Pastor Keith actually started speaking on revival um, a couple weeks ago. What a topic to jump into. Really, for the new year, what, what a topic to be able to jump into because a lot of churches out there are doing like new you, you know, reach your goals and new this and new that. And Pastor Keith's like, no, we're going to talk about revival, you know, and, and that's, that's the type of leader we want to follow. That's the type of leader that we want to be under and learn from, someone who's after the heart of God. And uh, I, I would like to pick up in this series and continue this series of revival. Um, and it, I was listening to Pastor Keith's message last week, and it was remarkable, um, the flow of revival. I loved what he was talking about, about the flow of revival and, and how it's just this natural progression that really comes from the heart of God into our lives. And, and he said a statement that, that just really stuck with me that kind of like led to the seed being planted and confirmation for what I wanted to share. Um, Brent and I were talking a couple weeks ago, and I was like, I got this, this, this message. I'm not sure if I'm going to share it or not. I'm going back and forth. But the confirmation of last week's message told me that this is what God has for today for this church. And so the title of this message is actually called The Confrontation of Revival. The confrontation of revival. And, you know, it, it may not be what you think that it is because we're going we're gonna to actually dive into a very well-known Bible story this morning that we are all very familiar with. But we're going to examine it in a very different way. Um, because I sometimes think that we believe that revival is just about our church. But it's not just about our church. It's about the condition of our heart. That's the difference. We've, we've lived in this Christian culture that has developed over the years that revival, revival in the church, revival in the church. Listen, if you don't have revival in your heart, you can never have revival in the church. That's just the way it's going to be. And, and we're going to look at a, at a Bible story this morning that really has to do with that. But um, I, I don't know about you, but when I was, when I was a little kid, there was a, a situation where I was younger, and I got, I got into a fight with my parents. I don't know if you've ever done that. You're probably holier than me. You probably never fought with your parents when you were little. Um, but my mom wanted me to clean my room, and I didn't want to. It's that simple. I did not want to clean my room. I've always had trouble being told what to do, um, and my mom and dad, all, like, pray for them still. Um, but they, you know, they, they were able to raise me. But I always had this nature of wanting to fight back. Wanting to just have the last word. Wanting to just say something back. There's just something about me. I like a good argument. I don't know why. But that's how I was as a kid too. And my mom is like, you need to clean your room. And I'm, like, I'm not cleaning my room. And I said these famous words. I'm running away. Right? I think seven or eight years old. Seven or eight year olds. I'm running away. And she's like, fine. I'm like, fine. I don't want to be told what to do. I want to go live my life. So I go to the fridge. I grab like two huggies. You remember the little plastic huggies that are full of sugar? Um, I grabbed two of those. I grabbed some like oatmeal cookies. You know, I grabbed like some peanut butter. And, and I didn't grab like jelly or bread, just a jar of peanut butter. Threw it in my backpack. Jumped in my little power wheel. And I was like, I'm out of here. It was the early 90s. That's all I had was a power wheel. They go about a half a mile per hour down the road. And I'm going, and I was probably gone maybe an hour. Maybe an hour. I'm like, I miss my mom. You know, like, you know, but I ran away because I didn't like to be told what to do. I ran away because I didn't want to obey. I didn't want to do that. And, you know, and it was only a matter of like an hour or two where I came back, you know, and all that type of stuff. And I was able to do that. But, you know, running away, I figured that's going to solve our problems. I will be dismissed from what I'm called to do if I can just run away from this. 
If I can just escape this. And think about, like, as adults, we want to do the same thing. We want to do the same thing. We want to run away from things. Like, we want to get away. Like, our kids are driving us crazy. You want to get away from your kids. Your spouse is driving you crazy. Not here. Other churches. Their spouse is driving them crazy. So you're like, I need a break. I mean, have you ever been like that? Are you like, honestly, like, just, I need, I need some me time, right? I need to get away. I need to just go away for a weekend or, or just give me a couple hours by myself because I just got to escape everything in life. And, you know, and it reminded me of one of the, like, the most famous runaways of the entire Bible that we can talk about is Jonah. This man that ran away. You know, and, and the book of Jonah is wild because this is one of those stories that we actually learn at a very, very young age if you're raised in the church. And even not, most people know the story of Jonah. They know the story of Jonah, and they know how this all happened and how this all established. But what I want to do this morning is I want to take a different look at the story of Jonah. Because a lot of times we focus on just one section of Jonah, but we dismiss what else happens in the, in the book of Jonah about this. So in Jonah, really, Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a boat for, in the port. After paying the fare, he went aboard it and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So the book of Jonah literally opens up with, hey, Jonah, you're a prophet. You're one of my people. I want you to go to the city of Nineveh, and I want you to tell them about me and who I am because their wickedness has come up before me, and I, I, and I know they're wicked. And so I want you to go there, and I want you to do this. And what's crazy is, like, you read this, and it's wild to me. Because it wasn't like it was a dialogue. God said, I want you to go, and Jonah just ran away. It wasn't like Jonah's like, how about, no, Jonah just ran away. There wasn't even like, hey, let me think about what I'm supposed to do here. Let me think about what God is calling me to do. It literally said he just ran away. He jumped in the boat, and he took off. And, you know, he runs away because he doesn't like what he's being asked to do. He doesn't want to go and preach. He doesn't want to be obedient to what God has said. Hey, I need you to go do this. Have you ever had God ask you to do something and you don't want to do it? I have. I have and I will. And you have and you will. Where God is going to say to you, I need you to do this. And you're like, no. Maybe you don't talk to God like that. I do. Like, we go back and forth, man. Like, because like so, God tells me a lot of things, and I'm like, no, that doesn't, that doesn't, that, I don't like that. I don't like the way this goes. And see, like, Jonah was facing the same situation. He was like, no, I'm not doing this. And, and Jonah, like a lot of us, like, Jonah wants to serve God, but he doesn't want to listen to God. And I think so oftentimes we can relate to that. God, I love you, and I want to serve you, but I don't always want to listen to what you want me to do. And, and it's crazy to me because, like, this isn't just some average guy. This is Jonah, who is a prophet of God. We don't know anything out that led up to this point. So, like, I don't know if Jonah had a church. I don't know if Jonah's preaching in the temple. I don't know if J Jonah's, like, meeting with people. But whatever it was, God spoke to this man, Jonah. And we don't know why. All we can get from the gathering of studying is that Jonah was a prophet of God. That's what we can gather. So, like, I would just guess that maybe he's preached before. Maybe he's taught before. And so for a man of God, for a, a, the, the preacher, for the prophet to say, no, I don't want to do this. This is like, this is a pretty big deal. Because this is what you're supposed to do. Like, if you're the prophet, you're supposed to be the voice piece of God. And now you say you don't want to. Like, that's, your, that's like your job description, dude. Like, that's what God is calling you to do, is to speak. But he's like, no, I'm not doing that. See, we have to understand and kind of dive into this and really understand why Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh to preach the gospel. Well, Nineveh was their sworn enemy. It was literally Israel hated Nineveh and Nineveh hated Israel. It went back like they hated each other. It was their enemy. And so let me, give you some, let me give you some historical background so you can understand this. It was the Syrian empire of which Nineveh was the capital city. And it was rumored that the, the Syrians that were there, that they were the most brutal people in that time. The most brutal people of, of that time. If the Assyrians would capture you, 
They would not only torture you, but they would torture everyone in your family. Sometimes a whole town of people would rather commit suicide than have this group from Nineveh come in and attack them because they knew if we get caught, it's going to be even worse. So this was like how scary it would. They would go into a city and they would destroy and burn everything. They would kill children and they would kill women or they would take them as slaves. They would take the husbands or the soldiers that they caught and they would take them outside of the city. And what they would proceed to do is they would skin them alive while they were still, like, while they were still cognitive. They would skin them alive. And then they would actually bury their heads in, uh, in, in the sand up to their heads. So their whole thing is buried. But remember, they just got skinned alive. Now they're stuck in the sand all the way up into their head. And then they would take their tongues out of their head and they would drive a stake through them. And not only that, then they would make, make them sit there and listen to Taylor Swift. Take me now, Jesus. All the Swifties are like, ew. (laughs) But then what they would do is then they would, after they had died, they would actually decapitate their heads and they would build a pyramid outside of the city. Just saying, this is what we do to our enemies. This is what we do to those that come against us. So have this understanding that Jonah was not just saying no because he wanted to be difficult. Jonah was saying no because there was a history of an evil people destroying his people and torturing them. There was an injustice done to Jonah and his entire family. There was an injustice done to his entire people group by this other group. Yet God says, I want you to go and I want you to preach the gospel. See, and and, and Jonah says, no, I don't want to go there. Okay, I can understand that now. I can understand why you don't want to go. God asked him to go somewhere and do something that was honestly probably terrifying for him to do. Because I'm going to go to the enemy's capital city? Like the capital city. The ones that do it like, and I got to preach the gospel? I don't, I don't want to do that. Like I can only imagine in Jonah's head, he's like, God, there's no way I'm doing this. So his instant no, he just departed and left and was gone. And, and I began to think about this and it's like, you know, he was commissioned by God and God told him to go. But yet Jonah took off and and said, no, I'm not going. And it's like, did Jonah not believe that God would take care of him and what he was called to do? See, he was commissioned to go to the city and to preach so that people would encounter God and know what revival was. But there was a confrontation in Jonah to say, no, my, my comfort level is not there. So my comfort level is to serve you, but not to tell them about you. The confrontation of revival began to hit inside of him. The confrontation of people knowing who God was. Jonah was like, no, no, no. You're good enough for me, but you're not good enough for them. The confrontation of it inside of him going back and forth saying, you know, God, I don't want to do this. Now, we know Jonah ran away. We know the story. He ran away. He got into a ship. It began to storm. It began to go crazy. Why? Because of his disobedience. And not only did his disobedience cause problems for him, but his disobedience caused problems for all the other sailors that were in the boat. So understand this. When you are disobeying what God has commissioned you to do, it not only affects you, but all those around you. You have to understand that. Because the way that God designs this plan is that when he has called us to be obedient, our obedience is dependent on what he's telling us to do, and he wants us to do it. So when we disobey, our disobedience affects all those around us. So we know this story. It begins to storm. Jonah says, this is because of me. Throw me, into the, throw me in there. And the soldier's like, nah, I don't know. I'm not sure. And then like, yep, just throw him in. So they throw him in in the middle of the storm, and the storm ceases. Soldiers are fine. They're good. All of a sudden, we have this big fish, big whale, whatever we want to say comes and swallows this guy up. And then he's in the belly of this whale or this fish for several times. Jonah chapter 1, verse 4 through 3, kind of talks about all this story. Talks about this whole encounter. I I encourage you to read the prayer that he prays to God. Because you're like, dude, this guy had a moment. He encountered God. This is amazing. uh, But I mean, hey, in the middle of your uh, your, your troubles, in the middle of tragedy, he encounters God. Right? In the middle of, of, of even his disobedience, God's like, nah, man, I'm going to save you. I'm not done with you yet. It goes on to say three days later, this fish or whale opens his mouth, spits him out, and he lands in Nineveh. What's, what's so funny, if you were to look at the, 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 the map and the chart of this, Jonah literally got in a boat that was taking him the complete opposite direction than where he was supposed to go. He was supposed to go over here, Jonah went over here, but then this well swallows him and puts him right back there. Because God says, just because you've been disobedient doesn't mean that your commission is done. Just because you've been disobedient doesn't mean that I'm, 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 I'm done with you. 
It means I still got some work for you. But this is where the story really picks up for me. And this is where I want to zone in. So Jonah says, okay, God, I'm going to be obedient to you. I'm going to do what you say. So in Jonah chapter 4, verse 4, Jonah goes into the city of Nineveh and he says, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. That's what he says. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. And I could only imagine, be overthrown, be overturned. I could only imagine what happened, like dead silence. Because I'm sure Jonah walked into the middle of the city. He walked in the middle of where everyone is. He made sure everybody saw him. And all he says is 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Silence in the audience. And I can imagine Jonah's like, oh, I'm dead. I'm dead. He's like, this will be the shortest sermon I've ever preached. You see, all of a sudden, something happens. Nineveh falls to their knees and they repent. And they say that the, all of the Ninevites in that time believed in God. Even even got back to the king of Nineveh that he encountered God in this experience. And that as he encountered God, he made a decree to in the entire city that no, we are to now put on the sackcloth and mourn and, and ask God for our forgiveness because we need. The entire city was saved, right? Everybody. Now I'll tell you, as, as someone, as a preacher or a pastor, if you go into a city and everyone gets saved, you're going to feel pretty good about yourself. Just natural human being, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm the man. Right? Because that, like, you went and you did, well, like, okay, God, I did exactly what you told me to do. I rolled into the city, the evil city. And can, like, I'm, imagine how Jonah, this boy, preached. Whole city gets saved. This is everyone's dream. This is like what God wanted. But in Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Jonah was greatly displeased and he became angry. He was mad and he was upset that the entire city was saved. Matter of fact, if you dig into the original language that was, that was here, the word greatly displeased comes from this Hebrew root called ra'ah, which means like an evil anger. That is connected to literally what the word hara means, which is like fire. So literally Jonah was burning with fire that the people of the city of Nineveh encountered a revival and got saved. But yet he's the one that was obedient to God. He says, God, I'm going to proclaim this message. He proclaims the message. The entire city gets saved and he's mad about it. He's angry about it. He's displeased that God would save them. He's displeased that this would happen. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, oh my goodness. So like what, does this, like, what does this mean? Again, remember I said, revival is not just about the church, it's about our heart. See, we find Jonah smack dab in the middle of this confrontation. Because in essence, what Jonah is saying to all the people is, God, thank you for, giving, for forgiving me. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Thank you for, for being there for me. Thank you for providing for me. Thank you for forgiving me from even running away from you. Thank you for all that you do for me. Thank you that I love you and I serve you. But I will never, ever, 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 ever allow my heart to be for Nineveh. I will do everything else. I will, I will accept your forgiveness. I will accept your grace. But I will never, ever, ever accept the fact that they got saved. So God's okay for me, but he's not okay for them. Man, how many times have we experienced this in our life? Where we're, we're, we like God for us, but we don't like God for our enemies. We don't like God for those who have done things against us. We don't like God who has, who has, you know, we don't want God to forgive those people who've hurt us so deeply. We don't want God to, to do anything for those that have gossiped about us, those who are trying to ruin us, those who came in and destroyed our marriage, and those, those that influenced our kids, and those that did all of these things. And see, we find ourselves in this great contradiction as well, because God is good enough for us, and God is good enough to be the God of, of Micah, but I don't want him to be the God of my enemy. I don't want him to be the, the savior of them. They don't deserve God like I do see this is the confrontation of revival that happens within our hearts is that we think that God is good for us and for CWC but for everyone out those doors that have done anything to us to harm us to hurt us to cause issues against us nah it's just good enough for us it's just good enough for us right here right now but you know what they don't deserve the God like we have 
We're okay with revival in our church, but we're not okay with revival in our city. We seek after revival for ourselves here, but do we seek after revival for those that are in darkness that need to be brought to light? Do we seek after revival? See, I, I pray for God for healing from my heart, that God will do an inner working of my heart and my emotions. But do I pray for that same encounter for those that are out there that have come against me, that my enemies have come against me? Do I pray for that same revival to be encountered in their life? So Jonah literally says, all right, I'm done. And he gets upset and he goes up on top of this hill and sits. He's like, I'm done with you. I'm done with this whole city. Forget about it. And then the Lord says in Jonah chapter 4, verse 4, what right do you have to be angry? What right do you have? But Jonah went up and he sat on the middle of the city. And a lot of people believe the reason he went and sat up on the hill to overlook the city is because he was really believing and praying that God would cause a massive disaster to happen to Nineveh. He was hoping that God would just destroy them and wipe them completely out and that nothing would be left there. And in chapter 4, we see this back and forth with God. So Jonah having his temper tantrum, being so upset about things, he's up on this hill and he's sitting. And all of a sudden he begins to get really hot because it's hot over there. It's hot in the desert. And so God's like, listen, I'm going to provide you with this plant and it's going to shade you so that you're not absolutely miserable. Even when he's mad at God, God says, I'm not mad at you. That's a whole other thing. So God provides his leaf to come over Jonah. And then Jonah's like, thank you, God. Thank you, God. I appreciate this. I appreciate the comfort right now that you're giving me because it's so hot and I need that. But then the next day, God sends a worm to eat the entire leaf and then there's no more shade. And it's all gone. And then Jonah gets upset again. He gets mad again. He takes it out on God. And he said, you know what, God, I'm so angry about this. You provided me with a leaf. You provided me with a vine. And then Jonah's response is, you know what? I am mad. I'm so mad I could just die. So Jonah can acknowledge God in his comfort and be okay with it. But he can't acknowledge him outside of that comfort and be okay. So I'm okay when God comforts me. I'm okay when God provides for me. I'm okay when, when, when I need him to do something and he does it. But I'm not okay when it's taken away from me and I have to face the heat and I have to face the world. No, see, the same God that has provided for me with the leaf that comes over and shades me in that comfort is the same God that's going to be with me when I'm in the heat. It's the same God. But yet Jonah is acting like so many of us and how I've acted so many times where God, I like your comfort, but I don't like that you're doing all of these things. Jonah gets suicidal over a plant. But here's the reality of the story of Jonah in chapter four. We read about this life of Jonah. We can see disobedience and obedience We can see Jonah's anger and his comfort. We can see his unforgiveness. We can see how God goes back and forth with Jonah. But I want to read to you the last passage, which is probably the most prolific, important passage that we read in the story of Jonah. And it's Jonah chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. It says this. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine, but you did not attend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. And many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about the great city? That's how the story ends. Should I not be concerned about the great city? See, when you read the story of Jonah, Jonah, the the book of Jonah, it's not about Jonah. It's not about his anger. It's not about his obedience or disobedience. It's not about a big fish or a big leaf or a worm. It's not about any of those things. When you read the story of Jonah, the story of Jonah is about a people of Nineveh. It's about their life in Nineveh. That's what it's about. It's about an encounter that they need to have with God. Because this is what it tells me. This is, and and, and I got this this past week when I was studying. So if Jonah is able to preach a short message and the entire city gets saved, what that tells me is that God is preparing the hearts of people out there for us just to open our mouth and be obedient. If we just are obedient to what God says, if we just speak the words that God has called us to, the hearts are already prepared to encounter the revival. 
That's what it tells me when I read this story. So if I am not willing to share God with my community and with my city, I have missed what this is all about. Because life is not about Jonah, and it's not about obedience and disobedience, this whole thing. No, this life is about Nineveh. It's about a city that needs an encounter. We have to understand that Christianity and and this whole thing can become a very comfortable thing. It can become an individual comfort where I am okay with having Jesus for me, but I'm not okay for other people out there to encounter Jesus because what they have done to me. We have to have this understanding that life is about Nineveh. Jonah has this confrontation in his heart. And I'll be honest, I don't like the way that story ends. I don't like that it ends with God saying, should I not be concerned about this city? And what's crazy is God calls it a great city. Should I not be concerned about the great city of Nineveh? In the beginning, it wasn't a great city, but now it is a great city. Why? Because these people sold out their lives to encounter God, and he saw a greatness within them that no one else saw. Meaning that there's greatness that lies within our communities that we don't even see. And it will not be exposed. It will not be brought forth if we are not obedient and deal with the confrontation that's in our heart of revival. I love revival. I love talking about revival. I love having all of these things. And and God, I, I love this whole thing that we're talking about revival. And we're seeing experiences. And people are getting healed. And they're getting set set free. And all of these things that we've encountered in the last several weeks are absolutely amazing. And I don't want to discredit anything that God has done. But I'm going to tell you, if we don't have revival in our hearts, we've missed it. If we don't have revival and say, God, I want revival to happen in the lives of those in the community. I want revival to happen. It's not just for, revival is not just for the church. The revival we've been seeking at CWC is not just for this church and this kids ministry and this youth group. No, the revival of this church is for this community. That's what this whole thing is about. Because if we just keep it in here, what will ever happen? Listen, I know some of you sitting here and you're angry and you're mad because people out there have hurt you. I know some of you sit in here and you're a victim and you've been devastated and you're mad and you're upset because of what people have done to you. And I hate that that's been done. It's hard to live life when you've had so many things come against you. But you have to understand, God wants to do a revival in your heart that is so deep and transforming and so big that you could say, I forgive them and I want Jesus for them and I want God to do a work in them and I want a miracle to happen and I want a true revival, not just to happen in my actions at CWC, but in my entire life and in my heart. See, I think Jonah is actually a warning that those of us are willing to spend our lives serving God, but not serving people. See, I love being a Christian. I love Jesus. I'd have no purpose without him. None at all. Zero. The one thing I know better than I know anything else is church culture. I've been in this my entire life. I've had the privilege of working and working for multiple churches. I have, the, I have the privilege of knowing this culture. But what I don't understand, I can never grasp my head around, is why are we not more prone to say these people need Jesus than ever before? Why are we not more prone? Why are we not stirred? Why are we not so just upset that people are not knowing who Jesus is? I don't get that. I want my life to be a testimony of revival that has happened in my heart where I, even if you hurt me, man, I, I just pray that God does something. This past summer, I had to deal with something that I called present forgiveness. That even in the present moment, what they're doing to me, I'm forgiving them. Even what's going on right now, I'm offering forgiveness. Because that's how God operates. His forgiveness is not based on a timeline, but it's based on a present moment and an encounter. And so I need to offer present forgiveness for all of those who've come against me. But this is what Jonah couldn't get. Jonah refused to allow revival to be in his heart. I'll be obedient to tell your word and that's it and then I'm done. What a sad story. What a sad way to, to end this. After years of service, we, you know, we start to forget how much we really need God to move. Because we can get so wrapped up in this. So wrapped up in just, we go to church every Sunday. That's what we do. We do the same thing over and over again. We read our Bible app devotions every morning. We do all these things. And listen, you need to maintain your spiritual 
your spiritualness. You need to have your spiritual disciplines. You need to read your Bible. You need to pray. You need to go to church. You need to be in fellowship with other believers. You need to do all of that. Absolutely. But if you're doing that only, then you are not being used in the way that God wants you to. The Great Commission is a commission. It's not an option. God says, go into all the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no caveat there that says, well, don't preach to them that, you know, if they hurt you, not, you don't have to preach to them. I'm not saying that you have to go into their life and be a big part of their life anymore, but I am saying that revival in your heart will say you got to pray for them each and every day, that something changes and shifts in them that brings them to an encounter of who Jesus is because God already might have them set up for it. But there needs to be an encounter in our hearts in order to make this happen. There needs to be an encounter I oftentimes read the story of Jonah, and I have several times over the last years, and I'm like, man, I really want a better ending to the story. I want, a, I want a better ending. And I really believe, like, God spoke to my heart and says, Mike, if you want a better ending to this story, then you have to write it yourself. The worst thing that we could have happen is God say to us, what about the great town of Tyrone? What about the great community of Blair County? What about the great state of Pennsylvania? What about the great nation of America? I don't want to end this with a question mark. I don't want God to, I don't want to end this with God asking me what I could have done better. See, the confrontation of revival is not about them, it's about us. Confrontation of revival is what's happening inside of us. If we want God in his entirety, then we need to be willing to have an understanding that entirety comes with forgiveness. It comes with grace. It comes with transformation. It comes with lost coming to be found, those in darkness coming to light. So this morning, I want you to have an understanding that the confrontation of revival is here. It's not out there. Saying, God, I believe that you're good enough for me and I believe that you can transform me so do it with them do me a favor this morning if you could stand to your feet and bow your bow your heads close your eyes for a moment I do realize that this is a very tough message to be able to digest But I want us to do something this morning that might be uncomfortable. I want us to do something this morning that might seem odd or weird or and, and might unnerve us a little bit. But what I want to do this morning is I want us to pray for our city. I want us to pray for our community. I want us to pray for our Nineveh. I want us to pray for those that need revival in their lives. I want to pray for those that are in darkness that will be brought to light no matter how we feel about it. I want us to have an understanding that God is preparing the hearts of those out there if we will just be obedient. So I'm gonna pray this morning and I'm gonna speak a blessing and a cry of repentance and maybe this morning, maybe you need to ask God to help you to have revival in your heart. Maybe you need to ask God to deal with the confrontation of your heart. Maybe you need to ask God to deal with the hatred or the anger or the bitterness or the unforgiveness or whatever it is in your heart so that we're able to say, God, I want to be fully used by you because there will be no revival in this church. There will be no revival in this community if we don't have revival in our hearts. So this morning, won't you pray with me? And if you want to pray out loud, you pray out loud. But let's go to the throne room. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you this morning. God, we come before you on behalf of the town of Tyrone. God, we come before you on behalf of our neighbors, our business owners, our family, our friends, those that are out there, God, that are in darkness, those that are out there, God, that have not always treated us good, that have not always treated our family fair. And God, it might be for generation for generation they've had something against us. But God, right now, I bind that in the name of Jesus. And God, I speak revival to happen into our hearts so that we can take it into our city. God, I 
speak for any offense to be lifted now in the name of Jesus. God, I pray for a clarity to come to our heart so that this confrontation that we go back and forth with, God, that you will allow us this morning to deal with this confrontation and saying, God, if you love them, I love them. God, if you believe in them, I believe in them. God, if you forgive them, I forgive them. I want to be more like you every, each and every day. Help me to be more like you tomorrow than I was today. Help me to have this issue resolved in my heart. Come on, church, begin to pray for those Begin to pray for your city. Begin to pray for your town. Begin to pray for those that even, may even be in your family. God, I pray, Heavenly Father, for a genuine encounter in the name of Jesus. God, that when we are obedient and speak, God, that you've prepared our hearts already to be able to hear from you, that revival will take place. God, I pray for a genuine encounter to happen. An encounter that moves us from the core of our being. God, that we are so amped to, to pray for revival in our own lives. God, let us pray for revival in those that are outside these walls. God, we are so... so and to be able to pray for you to do an encounter in us. God, do an encounter in them. We pray for healing for us. We pray for healing for them. We pray for comfort for us. We pray for comfort for them, God. We speak peace and life and comfort and knowledge, Heavenly Father, of who you are into this community. God, let's deal with our hearts. Let's deal with the confrontation of what goes on inside of us. Come on, church, just pray. Begin to pray. God, I pray that we will be a light into the darkness. God, I pray that for those of us that are in here this morning that have dealt with a conflict and a confrontation in our heart on how we view and see certain people in our lives. God, I pray that you will do some inner working in our hearts right now. God, that you will allow the Spirit of God to be able to change our hearts so that we can view people the way that you do. People that need to have an encounter. People that need to know you. People that need to be saved. People that need to know who Jesus is. God, help my heart. If that's you this morning, just say, God, help my heart. God, help my heart. God, I want to be more like you and less like me. God, I just thank you. Thank you for a revelation of who you are. God, this morning, I speak a blessing over this town, this community. God, I pray for protection. From the worst of the enemy, God, I pray for wisdom for the leadership and the, and the elders of this community. God, I pray for a boldness for every pastor and Christian that walk these streets. God, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bless this community, bless this town. I don't care what's been said about in the past, God. We're speaking life and blessing and peace over it now in the name of Jesus. And what, when we speak your name, no one can take that off. When we speak, Heavenly Father, from the word of God, it will not come back void. And so, God, we just speak over this community now a blessing in the name of Jesus. God, I pray for businesses to prosper. I pray for churches to be filled. I pray for leadership to have a genuine encounter with Jesus. God, I pray that you will transform this entire town from the inside out. As Pastor Keith said, what, what little good, good things could come out of Tyrone? God, I just pray that Jesus comes out of Tyrone. Jesus in us. How we love, how we view, how we experience. But God, allow us, if we go after revival, if we're pursuing revival in our hearts, God, that you will allow us, Heavenly Father, to know what you wanted us to know. God, that we will be able to see and experience and, and be able to see things differently, be able to transition our mindsets. Because God, this mission is about our community. It's about the people in our life. 
So God, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will continue to do a mighty work in our hearts. God, I just thank you and praise you for what you're going to do and what we will experience in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen. Now, part of being able to put into practice the transformation that, we t- that takes place in our hearts with God is by, by, by actually doing it. Actually doing this. Listen, I'm not going to lie. Some of you are still wrestling with, you're going to wrestle with some of this stuff. And guess what? God can handle that. God can handle the wrestling moments. God can handle going back and forth with you saying, God, I just, I have a hard time forgiving them. I have a hard time wanting to speak blessing on them. God can deal with that. You wrestle that out with him. You wrestle that out with him. You'll find when you do wrestle it out, it's going to be uncomfortable and it's going to hurt, but it's also going to change you for the better. But the other thing we have to put into practice is saying, how do I share this? What do I do? Well, you, you do this by going into community and letting them know, hey, does, do you know about Jesus? Do you know what Jesus could do? Might be out of our comfort zone to be able to do that. But we don't got time to waste. See, some of us, God has put people exactly in our path, exactly in our workplace. And he's like, listen, I've wanted you to share Jesus with them for so long. And all you want to do is talk about the news or your coffee or, you know, whatever it might be. Because it's uncomfortable. But what is more uncomfortable? Sharing Jesus with people or having to live with the fact that you had the opportunity and never took it? I don't want our story to end like Jonah's. I would love for it to be, I'd love for God to say, hey, what about that great city? What about that great community of Tyron? What about that great church that is commissioned and goes out there and sees people saved? That is what I want. Hopefully that's what you want too. So I want to encourage you this, this week, share the faith. Share the faith. Let people know that Jesus loves them. Some of you, it'll be by what you say. Some of it will really be by what you do and the actions that you take to show Jesus. There's a town out there that needs us to be obedient. And we need to be obedient in all aspects, saying, God, we want revival. But we're going to need it here first before we can ever experience it here. God, I pray that you bless your people. I pray that as we go out these doors, God, that you will give them favor. Even today, God, in the next several hours, I pray that opportunities will come to them so that they can share the love of Jesus with people. God, I pray that you continue to allow them to be driven to speak your word and to speak life. And God, I thank you and I praise you. God, I pray that your favor will go before them. I pray for God moments to be mapped out already now because you've destined it to happen. And God, I just thank you and praise you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Guys, have a great week. Have a great week.